at school outside of Rome, and that's on hold. But that was the kind of miracle that happened in the woods. So I have my own shrine in Thatcher Woods. It's, uh, I meditate, I walk, um, and the poetry I'm going to read, let me back up, this presentation is probably 20, 25 minutes. It's a keynote. I would rather be talking to you live, except I couldn't see some of you if, I, if you were here in the Zen Center. I would love to have my art on the walls. But this is a keynote presentation. It's about 20, 25 minutes. So I'm going to do a lot of reading, and I hope you enjoy the photographs that accompany. Um, I think the poems accompany the photographs. So I'm going to share screen. And afterwards, what I would like to talk about, the first slide will uh, give you a clue as to what I think about when I'm in the woods. Um, and it took a lot of courage. Um, some of the poems are about fearlessness, about having courage. Some of the poems are about getting old, turning 70. One poem is about children leaving home. Uh, a couple of the poems are about an unexpected virus. A couple of the poems are about this, uh, one poem is about the social context and the political and uh, the political climate we're living in. Um, you'll also note, you might, art references, art historical references, Caravaggio, Jericho, Matthew Brady's uh, Civil War photographs. So just sit back. I'm going to try to push play and hit this document. Give me a moment here. Play. And here we go. Did I? Technical help has come my way. Taking risk, overcoming fear, not knowing, curiosity, bearing witness, attuning, making art, embodiment, interbeing, insentience, wonder. I go to the woods every day, 14 months of wild display, a part of me nodding, I'm crazy, not knowing of natural dangers, facing fear beside fairies and gnomes, wild beasts lurk in a thatch of weed. I thought nature to be unbeguiling, preferring the hand of culture's making to the cloven hooves and yeti. No waiting for me to pluck my way, blinking light to lens. Dendrite tentacles sculpt the cold to certainty for a minute or three. At the water's edge, ice speckled sludge, frosting oak to ink. I am angry at the woods today for its obstinate lack of color. I prefer seductions of turquoise and coral, sunlight casting cobalt by noon, easing a dusk word slide into violet. 
a shiver of indigo, the fragrance of cedar. Breathe in the grays, the pond sludge whispered. Pewter, carbon, heliotrope, slate, silver, steel, and shadow. Close your eyes and taste on your fingertips all that is magically duller. Slide at 70, aging is how many ways to say slip or slide, causing level to morph to steep. To heaven or not, traipsing Eden to hell realm, ghost, knowing nothing for naught. Regret slickens to mudslide, paying her debt for bravery, amnesty granted for breathing. That dog-eared blame, a glassy-eyed Rasputin under which to be blanketed, still making amends. Oh boy, oh lord, she said, thank you for my knees. Raking shards with thank you for sweat and treason. Please mythologize my strategies. Caricature drawn by sunlight and wind at the edge of a pond, not caring a whit, little mi miracle dancer, hedging no claim, neither noticed nor bashful, vagabond of frost, lost only to fame. A thimble full of firmament. Why, yes, she said. I see glitter posing as stars. A glinting glare, a stare. Can it be me, the eye of the mirror's dark side? I cross my eyes to self, all gold rimmed to gray. My face dissolves into flint. Not now, whisper the citrus moon, shiver my solemn approaches by month and mystery's precision. Rising sly with the cry of a loon, I dictate the season for crime, a Doppler state of undertow. Stretched thin with a glaze of bitter, quivering with bold-faced derision, take that, raptor sun, you blistering enforcer.
Psychonaut jabbering babble into caverns of slack-jawed ink, worm-wooded spelunkers. Like blood from my head going black blue to black, haunted crossing over. Hallowed smoke of rock and roll, heaving blowhole spew, standing square to God. How odd to be looking at winter on one of the hottest days of summer. Why feel an edge falling so low, flailing a lighter shade of delusion? I thought you hung the moon. Like Icarus interrupting Paul's fall asunder, wearing Medusa's wig of ravens, snakes, and hissing. What's the difference, she swore, an offspring of war inside the cage of ribs. Tinkerbell's proximity to prayer, thrifting the store for a vintage sound, spilling a drop of minute waltz. One more catch of swoop and dance, responsible for swoon and reeling, careening to the clap of a finger snap. Good Lord, she said, help me and Madonnas of gloom and grit. Hallelujah is not mine to hoard. When questions of risk arise to flame, the shadow's edge quiver, shivers, disappearing into smoke unbeknownst to certainty, a curl, a curse of combustion, the yellow-orange hazard blackened spark to ashen, hissing a whisper to tame. I'm not a cadaver yet, she exclaims. Not a tooth, not a jaw, not a spine. Her mind's eye traveling to Rome. Chapels below Via Veneto, the Capuchin crypt is the home to 4,000 friars remains. What you are now, you will be. The sign advises us to see our fate as a dusty souvenir of time being. A scrim is devised for projection, a loose weave, screen, or sheath for nostalgic flights of conjecture. Silken tableaus of longing veil mists, distances between lost and seeker, hovering illusions of certainty. Bracing the catwalk from hither to yon, ghosts rise to hell with conviction, Imagining reality is just a soft cover. It's a tan-tongued Buddhist yearning, knowing not to know, not when, why or when, a circumference of nothing. 
double negative positive humming, chanting one lifetime, one meaning, humility and thrum beaten breathing. How are you? I'm deciding, true and sideways surprising. Can you believe not believing? This poem is dedicated to a student of mine and his art that is very much related to a painting by Fragonard of a girl in a swing. Candy-colored mirth, lush with fluff, pink satin skirt, billows frothy femininity, red to orchid pillows, cushion flirtation. Modest little pooty shy their eyes from the scene, High to thigh, tussled ruffles, divulged sublimity. The bishop's arm salutes the flight of cupidity. Lighthearted memento of delectable sights, risque and rather rascally in fanciful indulgence. This luscious little painting is salacious. Dragonfly winging wind and sea, spinning clue-born to habitat. Imposing ground rules for fireflies. Through spider silken stockades, aspiring cobalt, while brethren glide onto sea foam spittle, blinking code, shore, shore, shore to tiny dinoflagellates spelling out glitter little stars. Unsuspecting of what I might find in the brushwood by the river, sucked down quicksand and undertow. Scared of beasts behind stumps and logs, bone chilled by snakes and leeches, creatures and madmen hide in the mud. I never thought much of natural danger, preferring detritus and artifacts of culture. Now, every day, my fears mythologize bravery. Nephla of jet stone, black beads, organic rock, compressed like coal, cut, carved, and polished for mourning. Lace defines her fragility, white to pearl. Her skin shimmers, cream and rose. Grains of silk murmur, believe me. Rosaries for monks, gems for mistresses. Her hair shorn to nub, skull patched, shining. Dusk light soothes her incandescence. What drama, a honed-in look reveals ancient creatures conspiring to battle feats of risk for tarnished demons. Jagged curses, teeth sharpened for precision, silent ruckus of phantasmic enterprise, collisions of crystal captured by sleet. 
a walk in the woods and I'm witness till sunrise renders the zealots helpless as the pond sets to flow with a ripple. Filigree and crystal, gothic dust for swearing notice, despite trace appearances of hungry ghosts. To a eulogy's dance of ashes, a banquet of expectation beholds smithereens gone to rust. An elegy for shortening cinder, ruined from sheaf to tatter, offering sweets for flesh to bone. Two tiny boats wearing no canvas together. The weather is chancy for sailing. The captain calmed her worries. Being afloat is better than being squeezed tight in a knot. Soon to set course in the Caribbean. Water is wet wherever. She bobbed to Bazooki in the Aegean. I wept by the river's edge today, seeing a tiny twig's influence, temperatures drop to freezing. Whispers of air stroke the surface, marbleizing wet into crystal, baroque in a dazzle of delicious, caressing the spike of a weed, a puddle's slow show of indifference, a seedling as reliquary of silver. Ah, about art. The art of breath and touch held soft to line and pressure, dry brush loaded to water's level. Adjusting brine to twist and taper fluid free, more to open drift, a wisp to go, a trace has been. Released to liquid mist and wind, coinciding grasses bend to measure, marking trace from stroke to flow. Shantideva wrote about a log. He said, remain a log, just be a log. A log's precision fall crack, an end over end tumble, accepting the forest's decision. A perfectly positioned sprawl, grinning as frost nibbles its bark, rendering mute its abjection. No longer secured to limb or trunk, an arc for insects and rot consenting to cradle consumption. Primal ooze mud, a suck down deep blue black seepage between 10 toes of a barefoot Buddha. Paper cracked tar sipping leaves, weeping on the forest floor. Goose shit, psychotropic rabbit scat. A fallen down tree trunk bare but moss, riven with worm play patterns of a child riding a duck on wheels. She shuffled to the ashram, a surplus of brittle and bone, 
naked now to matters of mind. Reaching a proximity to death, her breath fell flat to undertaking, finding rest beside the riverbank. Scorching her costumes to blister, the corpse burned to ruby embers, illuminating her path to Rome. I wear this robe, formless circumstance, rendered silent in possibility. Marbled moonlit memorials, feeling wide distances deep in open dark, wondering. The becoming, finding beyond, faint far off within, far off within blind, belonging to none, bind silence to love. A plain weave pattern, form woven by experience, lower and lift of fingertips. Silks combed by the senses stronger than reed or stick, enabling honeycomb spaces. Pausing to restrict comfort, harnesses too heavy to keep weft and warp and twined lustrous. It's about what happens on a gray day, 11 straight gray as nameless birds flock to an oak and chirp hopeful. Maybe not caring these birds, easing onto bare branches, enough, really, to find a perch. That chirping, that calling out, like me, for like-minded voices, not knowing who might hear my call. <coughs> Rivers, brooks, lakes, and oceans, sea, streams, puddles, we know another shore is calling there. On the other side of the gap, not when, we are aware of ways for passing on slivers of reeds or stepping stones, not knowing that the other shore arrives underfoot, standing still on a dock or raft, the bridge needs both sides for holding. A mandala to That Thatcher Woods, sticks, vines, and snow circumnambulating a puddle. Needing no release to the river, maybe a deer will wonder who stopped by to gather her thoughts as snow fell from tree branches and mallards, chorused with a woodpecker. And they did stop by. They thought, what is this? I'll explain this photograph. One day I noticed that a beaver had taken down a tree and I think it happened in a day or so. This is the beaver's work. I tossed a stone onto a pond to see how my action would affect the surface gold in late afternoon dusk light. Standing rooted in something fleeting, seeing the interference of wave matter, what had been a tree's shadow interrupted. One stone casting a dream on my little screen of an instance of an instance time being. 
Waiting for the muck to arrive seems a peculiar preoccupation. Spring's first green to be seen, eliciting my hyperbolic imagination. Ghost tendrils of witch's hair, a spider's silk web, her trap. River mud that primal ooze, my boot sank into the black. I yelled help to no one there. It's not just the lotus that sanctifies shit. The mud holds it all. Beginnings not still of unfolding in story, some elements buried. The drama crash. The oak leaf has fallen to wind's anecdote. Two oak leaves caught in the grain of a log by the side of the path in the woods reminded me of a painting by Jericho. A shipwreck scene from 1819, disaster on the raft of the Medusa, captained by incompetence. One can analyze the painting's place in art history, thrashing of souls and brutality, a depiction of poor navigation on an ocean of hubris. Like a calligraphic splash of sumi ink in gold rather than black shadows cast by spotlights on my desktop. Hold the brush upright, tip touching the paper, move wrist to the right and outward taper, narrow to wider, start again brush moving down a circular clockwise rhythm arriving at crossroads for a tear shaped dot. Paths and rivers and streams present options for traveling from one stopping point to another. Welcome, my friends, to my new home office where tweets have gone back to their sources. One woodpecker knocks rhythm as I type. I can finish that novel on grief that I stored in a drawer in 2004 write a youthful commentary on aging or dying. Within a surround sound panoramic room, thinking of Atwood's unnamed protagonist covering herself sense full with leaves and loam. One can get a lot of writing done with few, if any, distractions, alone but for dear in this room of my own. Set up a studio for drawing, maybe. A plein air painting is full of potential. I can gather supplies for making art tomorrow. Moss green to paint tiny green shoots. Mud gray black for soft chiaroscuro. Red pin oak for sunset will be essential. The erotics of drawing, this is how it works. I was going to, by the way, teach a drawing workshop yesterday. I'm sorry I didn't. So here you go, here's how you can all learn to draw, right now. Take your found in the woods coconut, what? Half shell to the water's edge. It is a quarter full of yesterday's mud. Fill it with a smidge of pond water sludge. Find a few sticks of varied tensile strength and den density. Look for a log in the bog and sit on it. Moss add comforts now in spring. See what is there surrounds sound style. Oh my gods, how to draw objects and their watery, shimmering, rippling shadows. Breathe, breathe. Dip your stick in the sludge, breathe into what you see. Allow that stick twig to inhabit your body. You are that twig. Breathe, breathe it, see it, feel it. Dip the stick, a big twig for a log, a small twig for defining a twig, 
into your mud sludge, swirl it, test it against the coconut shell, aim it finger to wrist to arm to torso to gut to thigh, boom, splat, dance, make a mark, a line, push it hard, sway it soft, dip it into the pond water for a gentle rippled edge of a shadow, know that this is stupid and do it anyway. A full body line that is a tree, not you, me. I have not painted in a year and a half, not wanted to accumulate more stuff, stretchers and canvas stacked still. Gave away my oils, my pencils gone. To others, some have slipped away. Ephemerality is obviously plausible. My mind's eye is reverentially driven, thanks given to those unsolicited spirits. Ideas flow as vignettes of kismet. My new studio office washed away today as the Des Plaines River rose beyond banks of the muddy hollow. I have found that spot to be comforting. Arriving this afternoon with the will to draw again what I had painted with soil and leaves, early green shoots and pink seeds, winking spring are gone now to wind and rain and river my sense of disorientation, was it ever? I almost wept today as I turned on the path, citing my little home studio office in the trees, a place for seeing, drawing, breathing was back. The water has subsided by two feet or so, the flooding of the river a week ago, dark rings of mud on trunks and branches, my faux Morandi still life of glass shards intact. Unnoticed by mallards making mandalas of ripples, splashing wings stretched with spring preening. The shards that I left on my picnic bench swallowed four days under a spring flood just where they were then and now as so. Finding them was like panning for gold, a discovery of glittering ore, simply amazing. And I was a woman gone mad. I picked my way through brambles and muck to find them crying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. To the silence. For whom is this hut or hermitage, eaves of straw for deer to graze? Stick stacked walls brace household laws. Wind whispers through open gates, not knowing leaf from skin or sky or skin, blowing a lace of woven treasure. Twigs like bone, this rack of timber, hidden storehouse for a drifter's sack, a refuge when there's less to lack. Who is it that is bright now as we await whatever comes next, too soon, not soon enough for each inseparably bound and extricably sewn into community? It takes a virus to realize that nothing and no one stands alone. May we know we are together in our distances, no less unified. This Indra's net of consciousness, the many hands that touch the invisible facets of our lives, now aggregated in a brilliant display of equanimity. It's not that I go looking to find examples of hubris and clear sight, Titian's flaying of Marcius. One man slaying of another, unfeeling the three poisons, anger, ignorance, and avarice, call it denial and greed. Some live in a land of prosper, 
We are all gone to this moment of panic, the way of planetary grifters, sh shredding the skin of incarcerated people of color, nothing new, nothing learned, set down now a stepping stone for better, a petition prayer or hundreds for this man and his others. I don't want to leave. I am not done with what has steered me through sifting, witnessing what I don't know. Though certain not yet to leave my children, that's what breathing comes down to. A primal urge to keep them safe. Sound and fed and warm my body gave them a mother's prayer and now I trust and now I must trust the flight of soul binding us. The woods today revealed a remarkable display, a narrative of devastation, dark and rich textures, raw tangles, nothing of sense or order, nothing short of primordial wonder. The woods wood sold itself out to decay, winter's reference to Matthew Brady's endeavor, not caring a bit about spring's spangles. Lower level disturbances test patience of gods among us, walking and talking to ourselves, wondering how and when or if the earth's reset is knocking us flat into sync with roots and ripples. Her impulse is as potent as a steady gaze into streams of sympathy. After the storm, a day's rain like tears tangled the woods. Running the banks to mud, sticking warm to wet, lattice grid of bark could be gone, impenetrable stop, a respiratory system for breathing into knee-deep grief. Maybe an ancestor stone, a rock as it is, simple and steady. Embedded with wisdom, weakness chiseled as fault lines, an aggregate's reminder of flecks and flaws. Stardust and wind, thunder and tears on earth, torn, the heart is riven, the rock is given. Nothing is simple, though we know it is bidden to be just thus, thus just, true and obvious. Out from under the thrall of need and neediness to keep what is not ours to have and hold in any way. As if and as though a gravitational pull, our mind's inclination to hold tight, our hearts rest in ease to let go. Let you read this. An incident of physics and chemistry, no place defined by track, aware in the moment of a smashing crack. I am going to try to stop this share with this mouse on a computer that is not mine. This took a little bit longer than I thought. <clears throat> um, what I had wanted to talk about is taking risk, 
uh, facing chaos. Manjushri's sword. Uh, sitting in a posture of assuredness. I don't exactly know where I am. Let's see. Can you see me, Nancy Dowd? I'm at Mark, no. Okay, we have, we've got, ah, stop, share. Here we are. Yes? Got it. Thank you. <laughs> got it. So, um, part of what I'm up to in the woods is not knowing. I never know what I'm going to find. And bearing witness. So, the first of the two tenets of the Zen peacemakers. Not knowing, being open to whatever happens, whatever appears, bearing witness. And that is opening one's heart to joy and sorrow. Courage. Generosity has uh, three aspects in Buddhism. The first has to do with material goods, giving of things, money, rice, coins. The second is Dharma, and that's what I'm doing today, which is a kind of teaching. Giving, teaching. And the third act of generosity in uh, Buddhism is Fearlessness, giving non-fear, giving no fear. I mentioned in one of my poems, Attuning, and I was thinking of Dan Siegel. The process of attunement creates a neural state of integration that forms the foundation of the receptive dimension of reflective awareness. So an artist cannot make art without attuning to herself, her body, a stick, some mud in a coconut shell, the tree, the water, uh, losing a sense of self and feeling other, the other, attunement. Um, I'm going to give you a quick way of looking at art that you may not have considered. When, most, when we look at art, generally we respond to the subject matter of the painting, the drawing. So I'm going to suggest that you try something else when you look at any art. Try to imagine the artist's body as she made that painting. Was the artist holding a tiny brush, hunched like this? Was the artist Jackson Pollock standing over a canvas with his paint? What was that choreography of his body? So when you look at art, see if you can empathize the artist's body. Simply another way of appreciating art. And um, if you make art, take pictures, whatever you're doing, it's decision, decision, decision. How far, how close do I manipulate my photograph, which you can see I have mostly, and uh, make the color more intense, make the lines smaller. So it's a matter of feeling. Again, this is embodiment. Think of making art as embodiment, both from the viewer's point of the viewer's body in looking at art. Do you go close? Did this artist want you to step up to it? Do you think this artist wanted you to stand back, come close? So spatially move your body when you look at art. If you're making art, your body is the instrument. This is, you're not ma making a painting with a brush. 
You're making a painting with your body as brush. Um, I'm, I need a minute or two for questions, so I have two quotes. Pablo Neruda on the star-studded void. He wrote this in 1964. Felt myself to be pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars, my heart broke loose on the wind. And here is one of my very favorite quotes, and this was Danny Glover playing Simon in the film Grand Canyon. I felt like a gnat that lands on the ass of a cow chewing his cud on the side of the road as you drive by doing 70 miles per hour. So, are there any questions? I'm going to get this from there. Hello. Hello, Barbara Steiner. You know, there are some people. Oh my God, Susan Collins is in London. Hello, Hi. Susan Collins. One of my writer buddies, oh my gosh. So we have London. Um, we have Boston. We have my gorgeous daughter-in-law in East Hampton, Massachusetts. <laughs> This is great. This is just great. So a minute for questions, comments, please. And it's hard for me to see if anyone is raising a hand. Peter Cunningham is there as well. Hi. Barbara Steiner. I have to say. Wait a sec. Hang on. Got it. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hi, Susan. That's so wonderful. I could have watched those those images all day. I really could have. They're so. It was really great, and I really really appreciate them. Um, it just. I don't know. I just wanted to thank you for it, and thank you for putting yourself out there like this. It's hard to do. So, um, and it's really good to hear your words, and just gave me ideas, and it was just really nice to see you again. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. I, I also see Carol Adney from California. I haven't seen Carol since a long time ago. Hello. <laughs> You know, Susan, I was thinking um, while watching this, we go back to college times in Rome. And uh, one time you took me to see your grandmother in her apartment in New York. And you were so fascinated by all of her travels. And a lot of the things in your poems referred to far off places. Um, and I just, I hope you realized how influential your grandmother was in sending you on these journeys throughout the world. I loved it. Thank you. I'd love to get, uh, there are a couple in there I'd just love to have. And maybe you can tell me how. Okay. Okay, Susan. Hi, from Hi, London. Hi, dear. Oh, I've got my. a glass of wine because it's late afternoon. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Um, how edited was that? Did you have to work hard to, to choose? Oh, from the number of poems I've written and from thousands of photographs, absolutely hard. But I'm kind of a quick study, so it didn't take forever. Yeah. But I did edit out a couple of poems this morning. So. Yeah. <laughs> What's your criteria for editing then to make it? I mean, it felt very, uh, it had a great flow to it. I mean, it was a real performance. I thought it was amazing, really fabulous. Thank you, dear. Yeah. <laughs> really fabulous. I appreciate that. Yeah. Had to do with time today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? We, uh, it is just about 11, but if there's any other Susan? Peter. Hi. Hello. <laughs> well, first of all, it was humbling, which is awful for me. <laughs> but I, my quick question. 
which is about your process in terms of the poetry and the and the photography are you making notes when you're out there in the field do the poems come with the pictures or they come after how does that work for you um i'm not making notes unless i sit on that particular log in that particular mm -hmm. photograph of the crash log sometimes i sit on it and i do make notes but um the poetry pops up from the unknown just as the photographs do. So there's very little intentional collision. It just mm -hmm. happens, and that is part of the delight. And by the way, it was your film that inspired me to try to do what I did today. So I thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I just want to make sure I see everyone who's here. Before Jane Mortifee can't get on, but she's sending love. Jane Mortifee couldn't get on, but she's sending love. Ah, she's in chat. Jane Mortifee, and I'm going to say that I have had the unbelievable good fortune to be with a writing mentor who lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, and delightful groups of brilliant women some of whom are here right now from afar, and we gather in all parts of the world to write together, we laugh, we um, sometimes <laughs> stay up late at night. And that's where my writing, the Amherst Method, started a few years ago. I didn't know I could write. I mean, I knew I could write a good letter of recommendation, um, but I thank all of you, and here is Kate Morrison, I see, a writer who lives in Hyde Park. Hi, Kate. This is great. And Barbara Blades, this is wonderful to see all of you. Um, it is 2 after 11, so um, if any of you wish to ask me questions, make comments, I would love to hear them, send you anything. And uh, what I will do is send you over to Thatcher Woods if you're in the vicinity. But you need to wear mosquito something and boots and do not anticipate dragons and dinosaurs. Uh, Susan, so, Susan, yeah. I think we can go a little longer. I mean, that was a fabulous presentation that you made. And for me, it just showed um, your deep love of the woods there that um, you created. Uh, I mean, you took all those amazing images and then your actual painting, your skills as an artist just kind of merged with the woods there. And it was absolutely remarkable. Thank you, June. I will say that I felt like, I do feel like a crazy woman sometimes. The day I was yelling, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, the deer might have heard me. I've named, hi Mara, my daughter. <laughs> I have named some of the deer over there. But that little desk, that picnic table, and that computer I made out of bark and so forth. Uh, that was my refuge in March as this virus was taking off. So I felt like a crazy woman sitting in a bog in the woods typing on bark. <laughs> and uh, the miracle that happened, I mean that was true, that there was a flood, spring rain, I wept when I went over there and my picnic table office was underwater. I went back and everything on the picnic table, including the coconut shell that had housed the mud with which I painted, the shards of glass that I had arranged like a Mirandi still life, everything was there. I couldn't believe it. The next rain, it did wash away. But um, t that is the kind of amazement that happens four blocks from my house. And I see my son and my granddaughter now. <laughs> wow. Hi from East Hampton. So 
This is a fabulous gathering of people. It's thrilling, really. So I felt like a gnat that lands on the ass of a cow chewing his cud on the side of the road that you drive by going 70 miles an hour. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was extraordinary and truly inspiring. Just beautiful. Thank you, Robin. So enjoy uh, not being in winter today. <laughs> um, it's very hot here in Chicago and hope to see you all in the real soon. Bye. Bye.